Welcome to Winchester Cafe Sci Online and a special welcome to those joining us for the first time. A recording of this talk will be posted on our YouTube channel where you'll find recordings of all our online talks. And the details are in the chat as and so are the details of our website. If you enjoy tonight's talk and you're not on our mailing list, you can sign up for it there to be notified about future talks. After tonight's talk, we'll take a break for a few minutes before the Q&A. Please put your questions into the chat and we'll read them out. That includes our viewers on YouTube. So tonight's speaker is familiar to many of you, but one night only I shall be spinning an additional plate and giving the talk myself. So 5G and the Internet of Things. Well, we've had mobile phones for 35 to 40 years. So why do we need another G? But what is 5G? You can see it promises to be a lot faster than the generations that have come before. Is it just a new faster thing or will it enable new technologies? Well, first, let's have a look at the history of cellular comms. It's fast. Is it just a new faster thing or will it enable new technologies? So in the early 80s, we had the first generation of mobile telecoms. The first UK call was made in 1985. Uh, then in, 19, in the early 90s, we had 2G, which was the first digital network. 3G came along in 2001 as the first broadband network. It was also the first G to be defined um, by the 3G partnership program. The previous Gs were defined in relation to that. 4G came along um, offering its, with its smart antennas uh, greater bandwidth and more flexibility in how we use spectrum. Looked at another way, 1G was an analog circuit switch service with poor security and poor frequency utilization, less than two and a half K bandwidth. Uh, it meant it could be hacked into uh, or listened into um, by anyone with a frequency scanner because it's completely unencrypted. 2G was digital, uh, it was also encrypted, so it got around a lot of those problems. Uh, it was known as the global system of mobile, although it was far from global. The US in particular had a, a different system. Uh, it was circuit switch voice, but it did allow packet switch data, which meant that multiple users could share the same capacity. It brought in roaming uh, and also a SIM card for identity, short message service and the fairly primitive web browser. 3G was like 2G, but faster, uh, gave better frequency utilization, lower latency, uh, which is the round trip time uh, for a um, signal to go from the device to the host and back again. Uh, it also brought in video telemetry, telephony and mobile web standards with full web capabilities and allegedly up to 384 kilobits per second. 4G was the first proper wireless broadband. Uh, it eventually came up with voice over IP, uh, much faster bandwidth, much greater capacity. It enabled content streaming services um, and data intensive navigation services like Uber. Up to 100 megabits, it was the first unified global standard. And each new standard means faster web browsing speeds, reduced latency, and the ability to connect more devices to a network at the same time. So is 5G just a faster phone, or is there more to it than that? Our Randall Kenworthy, writing in Forbes, said, many believe 5G will become the underlying fabric of an entire ecosystem of fully connected intelligence sensors and devices. Let's talk about spectrum. And I don't mean Captain Scarlet in this case. 5G latency below 10 milliseconds for the round trip time. That's quicker than the human nervous system can respond. So it feels instantaneous if you're using something that provides some kind of feedback, haptic feedback to the device. So it, you actually feel the movement in it. You, won't notice delay in that. High bandwidth, 
much higher connected device density. So you can have sports stadia full of people uh, all connecting and getting good service. Much greater reliability, better frequency utilization, uh, wider frequency ranges, delivers the internet of things, which we will come to later, and potentially um, using millimeter waves, which provide very high speeds, uh, but tend to be blocked by the environment. They have very, uh, they use very high frequencies and you get very poor environment uh, building penetration, for example. It also supports things like augmented reality. So the spectrum involves radio frequencies that carry data from user equipment to cellular base stations to the data's endpoint. The range of radio frequencies in the sub six gigahertz range and also millimeter range uh, wave frequency above 24 gigahertz. 4G networks use frequencies in the sub six gigahertz range and will be shown in space with 5G traffic. Lower frequency bands for less densely populated areas because data can travel further, though slower on those frequencies. The higher frequency base stations have to be much more numerous and much closer together, and it will always be uneconomic to try and put those into remote areas, which is why 5G will be taking over some of the, the lower frequency bands. So in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum, this is from Ofcom, so it's very much UK based. So where are we in all this? Um, so your home Wi-Fi will be in the 2.4 gigahertz range and also the five gigahertz range. 2G was initially 900 and 1800 megahertz, 1 1.8 gigahertz. Uh, 3G went into 2.1, 2.2 gigahertz. The main band for 5G will be 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz, but it's also using some of the former terrestrial TV uh, bandwidth or spectrum, uh, which, as I was saying, will provide better coverage in remote areas. So the millimeter wave uh, spectrum, which the US is looking at using, but is not currently on the agenda uh, in the UK at any rate, are these stripy bits up here going up as high as 66 gigahertz. That is several orders of magnitude lower frequency than visible light. So you could practically multiply that by 10,000 to end up in the, the visible light range. Above visible light is where you get into ionizing radiation, uh, where it can actually cause chemical change. Uh, and that starts with ultraviolet, goes through X-rays and gamma rays. So mobile phone signal is a heck of a long way away from anything remotely dangerous. It's even a very long way away from visible light. Um, compare 4G, as I said, it's also known as LTE, and I'll use the two terms interchangeably. Um, so the, the radio frequency ranges for 4G were lower. Uh, in theory, 4G peak rates are 75 meg for the uplink and 300 meg for the downlink when using a multiple input, multiple output antenna system. 5G networks come in two sets. Frequency range one is from 450 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. And frequency range two is from 24 to 53 gigahertz. Peak data rates for a fully mature 5G network claim to be 20 gigabytes downlink and 10 gigabytes uplink. It may be seen how that will evolve once uh, services are properly rolled out. We talked about MIMO, uh, massive in, uh, in, sorry, multiple input, multiple output. Instead of just um, each device talking to one antenna on the base station, uh, we're now turning base stations into virtual Christmas trees with many dozens or even hundreds of small antennae and each mobile device as well um, can have multiple antennae so you can use multiple connections at the same time, which gives more bandwidth and more reliability. Looking at a visual, um, comparison of how the two compare. Um, 
big differences in energy efficiency, numbers of simultaneous communication at connection between 4G and 5G, um, latency several orders of magnitude better as is peak data rate and significant improvements in uh, cell spectrum use efficiency as well. So to summarize objectives for 5G, firstly, networks will be handling a thousand times their current data volumes. That's not that you will be using a thousand times more volume, although potentially you'll be using more, but just that there will be very, very many more devices uh, on the network sending using data. Um, there will, so that will be 10 to 100 times more connected devices. Um, in 4G, there can be around 2,000 connected devices per square kilometer, whereas 5G is expected to support up to a million connected devices per square kilometer. Typical end user rates will be 10 to 100 times what they are now. Uh, lower latency, um, so it's just a few milliseconds end to end, so little that anyone will, also, will notice. It will also provide support for very low power devices that will have very long battery life. So we're really talking about three overlapping domains that 5G will, be, will deliver. On the one hand, the thing that most people are aware of is the enhanced broadband with much greater capacity um, and deep connection uh, density. Um, we then have the mission critical services, which will provide strong security, ultra high reliability, ultra low latency, flawless mobility. These will be premium services, premium costs, but they, they can be delivered where they're needed. At the opposite end of the scale, we'll be connecting massive numbers of things with very high density very low complexity and low energy, but very deep coverage. So that type of signal will penetrate even uh, underground locations and further into buildings and so forth. Um, that can be looked at in another way that um, the low latency slice for the critical apps that we talked about, uh, the low throughput slice, for sensors, internet of things, smart home and so forth, and the multimedia slice, which is what everybody associates with uh, mobile broadband these days. So sort of scenarios that 5G develops, it's amazingly fast, both with a very high bit rate or uh, high bandwidth and minimal delay. It will have the accessibility to cope with dense crowds. It will also have enhanced mobility, so the, the good experience will follow you around. Uh, it will have super real-time and reliable connections and ubiquitous things communicating uh, with each other. Again, some sort of headline figures, uh, data rates one to 10 gigabits, Capacity, uh, looking at users potentially using 36 terabytes per month rather than 500 gigabytes, which is probably still quite a lot for a lot of people. Um, energy usage will be about 10% of today's consumption. Latency down in a fraction of milliseconds. Reliability available. This is the the fabled five nines, 99.999% uh, of the time, it should be available, at least for the, uh, the highly dependent, highly secure services, um, but also uh, potentially very long battery life and very large number of connected devices in an area. Greater capacity available to 5G will help make it more reliable than older network technologies. Drop call should be a thing of the past. Your network experience should be good even in very busy places. And 5G will be suited to things where reliability is essential, such as self-driving cars and remote surgery. It will support full mobility traveling up to 500 kilometers an hour, which may not be that useful to 
people in their self-driving cars, but it will apply to high-speed rail, uh, potentially to drones and a number of other devices and potentially aircraft when you get um, satellite integration with 5G as well. It will provide ultra reliability, um, ultra reliable low latency communication. This one's claiming six nines, which is um, quite extreme, uh, but essentially it uses a, a, a protocol called coordinated multipoint, um, which just provides spatial diversity with high capacity. What that means is you'll be able to talk to lots of different or through lots of different bits of network infrastructure. So you won't be reliable on, reliant on one pathway, you will have multiple pathways available to you. So to summarize some benefits of 5G, think of it as an accelerated change agent. It's not so much the change itself, it's like the telegraph and the telephone. If you can imagine all the changes um, in societies that those two technologies delivered, this is likely to be at least as significant in the changes it delivers. Yes, it delivers large digital payloads and security, but very much a change agent, not the change itself. Some people have likened it to the Roman viaduct or the, the, the railway network or even the space program in terms of the change it's going to deliver. But what about when reality is not enough? Enter the worlds of virtual and augmented reality. The virtual reality or VR embeds users in a fully immersive 3D computer simulated world, usually with a specially constructed headset. Augmented reality or AR or sometimes XR, it's the same thing, splices virtual elements into a real world view for example heads up display of a modern jet fighter or tiny monsters battling in your local park bench in pokemon go immersion is the key to alternative to augmented reality and particularly uh, virtual reality experience so laggy or unreliable connection can prove disastrous and a jerky virtual reality experience can make the user feel physically sick with augmented reality you you'll be able through a fairly similar device to simple device to reveal things you wouldn't normally know about or see like a lot of contextual information as you're traveling around perhaps in unfamiliar places but imagine a pair of glasses that revealed all kinds of information as you move about this will have eye tracking cameras you'll be able to scan menus just by glancing at them, select things by blinking or using audible commands. They have a number of cameras and microphones. And that might sound a bit fanciful and you think, well, yeah, do I really need that? What's that really useful for? Well, this technology is already being used. It's, if we look at uh, working professionals, for example, um, this technology is now being used for people who are working remotely on um, different types of high risk infrastructure. So if you imagine you're, you're working on some equipment um, at the top of a mast or a tower somewhere, you don't want to be fumbling around trying to find your way through a manual or learning where things are. Um, if you've got that kind of augmented reality um, goggles, let's say, then it enables a lot of different two way communication. So you can see information that you need in your visual field. You can also be supported by people remotely who can either be training you or advising you or helping you with um, whatever issue you're trying to work on. But it can transform how children learn and play. And children are already chasing virtual characters um, on their phones, but with this, it will literally bring them into their world. Tourists exploring historical sites will, could see them in their original state. Families who are physically apart could actually 
get close to the experience of somebody actually being present in the room with them in three dimensions. And people with disabilities can experience things that might be impossible or unsafe for them in real life, like running, skiing, riding bikes and climbing mountains. Why does extended reality need 5G? Well, 5G will enable virtual reality devices to offload the intensive computational work they require to the cloud, become much smaller and more wieldy. You may have seen some of the, the earlier devices that look a bit like a welder's helmet. In time, they won't uh, because they won't need the, uh, the amount of power supply, they won't need the amount of processing, that will all be done into the network. Video formats will be much more data intensive than present, uh, thanks to VR and AR applications. For example, interactive six degrees of freedom video allow you to move around within recorded videos and can require up to 10 times the bit rate required for 4K video. So increasing complexity in remote control devices Haptic feedback in the so-called tactile internet will require much lower latency from a mobile network that could never be delivered on three or 4G networks. But 5G will also deliver the fourth industrial revolution. So what do I mean by that? Well, historians have, of technology have defined industrial revolutions in different ways, but one way of doing it is to say, the first industrial revolution was mechanization uh, involving steam power or water power. The second was electrification and mass production, production lines. The third was digitalization, uh, where first started using auto uh, automation and information technology uh, to deliver improvements. The fourth industrial revolution is generally held to include connectivity and particularly with a wireless edge where factories can be reconfigured remotely um, using mobile robots, connecting moving parts, uh, single network and so on. So you, you combine connectivity with with powerful processing, artificial intelligence, and edge services, where the data is uh, processed much closer to the device. So for example, if you've got um, things that require very fast latency, if it has to go back to a host, then the, the round trip time for the debt, the uh, message will be far too slow for some of those services. Um, what can't be done locally uh, at the device level will increasingly be done within at the edge of the mobile network. So it will be much closer to the device itself and you'll get a much faster response time. So 5G will expand wireless to new industries and create new value. Um, IHS economics uh, have estimated five trillion in value across five different manufacturing, uh, five different industrial sectors by 2035. Um, main one being manufacturing uh, with transport, construction, uh, utilities and mining all being very significant values on that. Um, Qualcomm, who have, who provide a lot of the um, processing ability for mobile phone devices, have put a rather higher value on it than that, but they've taken in rather more uh, different industries. So they're putting a value of uh, potential economic value coming from 5G from the mobile ecosystem extending to new industries, $13 trillion by 2035. As with any forecast, uh, the one thing you know about it for sure is that it's wrong. What you don't know is by how much and in what direction. So the key developments of 5G are enhanced mobile broadband. These are the ones that most people are focused on uh, with high data rates, but also 
much improved latency. But it will also deliver massive machine type communications with low data rates, but very high device density that could never be achieved before uh, to handle connections to lots of uh, smart and dumb devices that form part of a, a wider infrastructure and operating frequently on very low power devices. Uh, and also the, the ultra reliable and low latency communications, which will be the high, highly reliable um, premium end the services. So we're looking at virtual experiences anywhere, anytime, uh, but massive connectivity and mission critical Internet of Things. Well, I keep talking about Internet of Things. What do I mean by it and how do we define it? One definition, the Internet of Things is the extension of Internet connectivity into physical devices, be they sensors, controls, home appliances, etc. Such smart connected devices communicate over the internet where they can be remotely monitored and controlled. Another useful definition, uh, Internet of Things is a system of devices connected to the internet with the ability to collect and exchange data from users or environment with no human intervention. The device or thing in IoT could be any device embedded with electronic software and sensor like a smart fridge, smart air conditioner, household lights, connected security systems, or even a person with a heart monitor or an automobile. Don't I wish my neighbours whose house alarm has been going off all day has had something like that so they could actually get notified that there was a problem, check in to their security system and turn the bloody thing off. So the internet, remember, is a distributed network of individually addressable devices. The World Wide Web, which people often think of as the internet, is a system for delivering content as web pages. But what are things? Well, they can be lots of different things, sensors, actuators, automation. They are data driven. They often involve, enable machine learning. They can include smart homes, but they can also include connect smartphones, but they can also include connected homes and connected vehicles. And anything that can communicate without being alive, in effect. But where are they? So it can be anything from energy management, environmental monitoring, or weather stations, managing infrastructure medical and healthcare, transport, home and building automation, particularly for large industrial and commercial premises, manufacturing management and large scale urban development. Components of Internet of Things, so you have a thing or device, a gateway that it communicates with, which might be the mobile network, might be satellite, might be various other things. That gets the data into the cloud, but the processing might have been done in the gateway to enable that to happen more quickly. Then produces large amounts of data, which are then require further analysis on the way to the user interface. And yes, lots of data, big data. What's big data? But well, one definition of it is too big for your computer, which requires tools and techniques so that data, large blocks of data can be mined and sliced and analysed, working on the part that you need to get useful insights and, and solutions from it. Those smart cars are a good example. Uh, it's been estimated by Gartner that 94% of new cars will be connected to 5G by 2028. They'll be able to communicate and share data with other vehicles and connected infrastructure, avoiding accidents and traffic, and telling smart cities where traffic is building up so routes for other vehicles can be adjusted. This is actually a biggie. Um, 
mobile networks in previous Gs had not allowed direct device to device communication. It's always had to go via the mobile network. Um, in 5G, that will not be required, which potentially speeds things up and devices can effectively be daisy chains that they've performed form their own networks and they help to pass communications between themselves and their infrastructure. In cars can also power air quality sensors that can measure the uh, air quality where the vehicle is, pass that back to um, local authority monitoring, as well as in car entertainment systems, augmented reality dashboards that might provide journey information up on your screen, and even full vehicle automation. So we're ushering in a new connectivity era, things connecting to things but also people connecting to things. Uh, so potentially more enabled med medical devices. Um, so where I was talking about things having very low bandwidth, very long battery life, if you had um, some kind of embedded medical device or sensor, um, perhaps like a um, internal defibrillator, you'd want that to last as long as it possibly can. And so looking at 15 year battery lives is very necessary. These things don't need to communicate a lot. They don't need to send a lot of um, data, but these sort of devices can sit on a very low power state for a very long time and only get woken up when there's something that they actually need to do. Um, 3G, 4G uh, has limitations for internet of things. The end-to-end -end delay can be too long in a lot of cases. Uh, it's not predictable for remote control and actuation. You might be pressing a button at one end um, and the, the signal just not getting through to where it needs to go. Centralised computing needs high uplink bandwidth, which 3G, 4G don't provide. Uh, the density, extreme density of IoT devices is not supported, um, in fact trying to support large numbers of uh, low rate devices really upsets the functioning and optimization of 3G and 4G networks. But 5G leads to explosive growth in number of connected devices. So if you look at these um, circles here, between 2003 and 2020, the human population hasn't changed very much. The number of connected devices has grown explosively across smart homes, intelligent transport, business environment, logistics, health monitoring, and so forth. In fact, during 2008, the number of things connected to the internet exceeded the number of people on earth. And these things are not just smartphones and tablets, they are a variety of sensors and actuators. It's reckoned there are now probably 50 billion connected devices, and you can see how the growth of connected devices has gone relative to the number of people. Is it possible to assign devices, addresses to all the devices in the world? Well, IPv6 has an address space of 2 to the power 128. There is no prospect of running out anytime soon, and if we do need another version of IP, then that will no doubt follow, but uh, it's been suggested that we probably have enough IP addresses to put one, allocate one to every can of beans if we need to. So farewell to old tech. Well, 1G has been turned off some time ago. Uh, 2G is being progressively turned off now. Um, if you're very attached to your 20 year old Nokia phone, I'm afraid even if the device still works, the networks won't be there to support it much longer. 3G was overtaken on its data volume by 4G just about last year. Um, and 4G is forecast to reach its peak volume around about 2030, um, at which time 5G will be overtaking it. And 5G will probably hit a peak around about 2040. And yes, there are people who are already working on standards for 6G. 
So on to the edge. I talked about this a little bit more a uh, little bit earlier, but um, to achieve scale, intelligence must be distributed to the wireless edge. So if you take um, a motor vehicle, for example, that has the power supply and the, the sheer physical ability to carry quite powerful computing on board, the uh, small medical device or a remote sensor that's is designed to essentially fit and forget it and leave it in, in situ for 15 years, um, that does not have the ability to do things on the device. And when you don't have the, the power to do the, the processing locally, then you have to move it further away. Moving it right over to the cloud may be too far away for some services, not all. And where that's the case, um, there will be distributed intelligence within the 5G networks. Industry will also use edge networks um, to provide those kind of links to, to link devices together. So effectively, um, it will be integrating cloud processing, edge processing, and device to device connections. So looking at some scenarios of where this would come into use, uh, precision agriculture to pr improve production efficiency. This could be an ad hoc private network that's set up um, to work a particular part of the ground, or it might be permanently in place. Um, you can see where a large amount of infrastructure is deployed and synchronized together. Um, that may well provide reason for uh, the control and monitoring. There's no reason why these uh, vehicles even need to have drivers in their cabs for that matter. Uh, it can also support connecting energy grids for more efficient production, distribution and consumption. Uh, fast crowds in huge stadiums can not just have access to normal communication services, they could have mobile action replays on their own portable device. Uh, they can have potentially augmented reality um, providing information on the visual devices as well. You could have a private network um, operating over an entire container port. Each of these containers could have an individual module uh, that is tracked and its, its content and its location uh, monitored. Uh, so where the full inventory is at any given time will be known and verifiable. Some of the things in manufacturing and on airports as well to uh, boost efficiencies significantly and better road efficiencies with smart transportation where vehicles operate much more cooperatively and where they can also communicate um, back to traffic management systems. Probably means a lower role for drivers and questions being asked whether with infrastructure like these kind of roads, whether it's even safe to allow human drivers onto them rather than leaving it to automated systems. Finally, uh, digital healthcare um, has the potential to provide individualized healthcare uh, based on an individual patient's needs and specifics. The things or devices are not just endpoints, they can be integral parts of network communicating with each other um, as well as with network outside. So summarizing some applications, um, business consumer, um, you can have smartphones, uh, smart homes with smart appliances, support for elderly relatives perhaps. Uh, you might want to keep an eye on somebody if you know that they regularly get up at nine in the morning, put the kettle on. One morning they don't get up and uh, the system doesn't seem putting the kettle on. You might get an alert just to make a phone call, just check everything's okay, rather than oh, somebody might have fallen over or something like that. Um, Industry and farming, we talked about smart manufacturing and agriculture, uh, smart city infrastructure, smart energy and environmental monitoring, and commerce, medical and healthcare, transportation and building automation. 
we look at further at the benefits of connected home, access and control from anywhere over the internet. I imagine a lot of people probably do this already. Um, I certainly find it very useful uh, when I'm away from home to be able to check on temperatures, um, turn heating on or turn cooling fans on if I'm anticipating arriving in an hour or two's time, say, and the temperature needs adjusting. Uh, you can also monitor the security and uh, power usage optimization. And certainly since I've had a smart meter, I've been much more aware of the usage of electricity and gas and controlling um, which devices are used when uh, in relation to variable energy prices and the variable carbon rate on the grid. Smart cities provide lots of possibilities, um, integrating all of smart energy, security, sanitation, education, infrastructure, healthcare, and transportation. There are lots of different ways of estimating the value of the Internet of Things. GE took the approach of assuming you could make 1% savings on costs or uh, investment capital in, uh, expenditure or system inefficiencies across a range of different industries. And over 15 years came up with these figures of savings just based on a 1% improvement. That's not to say that, they, that it will be limited to 1% improvement, but if that's the best you can do, there will still be very significant savings, $150 billion in waste across those industries per percent of improvement. So potential of Internet of Things, uh, improved performance, creating innovative services, reducing costs, reducing energy use as well, and creating new revenue streams. There'll be a number of scenarios and challenges. It'll be amazingly fast, great service in the crowd, best experience follows you, super real-time and reliable connections, and ubiquitous things communicating. And that brings me to the end. Thank you all very much for listening. Feel free to unmute yourselves. Uh, we'll take a break for a few minutes uh, very shortly. Just to, let's get some questions in the chat uh, for after the break. For that, a quick heads up on our next talk on Monday the 7th of June at 7.30. Uh, I have a talk on blockchain from Bitcoin to saving ecosystems from my friend Walid al Scaf. We'll stop the Q&A in a few minutes, but in the meantime, feel free to turn on microphones and cameras and chat amongst yourselves. Right, having taken a brief break, I think most people are, seem to be back or not far away. Um, so we can pick up on some of the the things that people put in the, the chat and uh, any more that people want to mention. So, um, yeah, Don's saying when my low data device finds the need to wake up after 15 years, will the language it uses be understood and will it understand any responses? Well, yeah, where the system is designed to work over that length of time. Um, the, the essence of these devices is that they will uh, they, they will probably become obsolete before the batteries die, uh, is essentially what that's about. Um, so, yeah, they're probably, they're not going to sit there for 15 years and then suddenly be woken up. It's more that they might be used once a month, once a year or something like that, and they will continue to be there. Um, and that's the sort of thing that was never viable if you've only got something like a 12-month battery life. Um, but the, they just stay in a, a low power mode until something triggers uh, them wirelessly, either wirelessly or um, algorithmically to uh, activate at certain points. 
Uh, John's asked how is power consumption reduced uh, to 10% of today's consumption? I have to say, I don't really know the answer to that. It's a sort of fairly in-depth um, network engineering type question, and I'm not an engineer, network engineer, so I, I can't answer that, I'm afraid. Uh, Frank has said in some regions 2G will stay for quite some time. Indeed, that's true. I'm, I'm working on a project in a uh, conservation project in Gabon at the moment, um, where we would very much like to be able to upload uh, image and video data from camera traps uh, using mobile networks. When you look at mobile network coverage, there's some mobile network coverage in a few places. But when you actually look at the detail in somewhere like that, which is a, a, a relatively prosperous African country, but still a, a very poor country by most standards uh, with a population of about 2 million. And you'll find that the coverage is only 2G um, virtually everywhere outside a couple of major city centers. And 2G coverage is not really usable for anything other than voice, certainly not for images. So in places like that, 2G will be available for a long time, but in more prosperous and advanced economies, um, because the new generations uh, provide much more efficiency, uh, much more bandwidth, um, much more cost effective, the networks are keen to turn them off as soon as possible, I think. Australia and New Zealand, if I remember correctly, are pretty much 2G free now um, because it's much better to operate on on those kinds of net, on the uh, the highest standard network that can use the same frequency. Um, so same order. Uh, costs of setting up, running the systems and the need for scarce materials. Um, yeah, the, the costs of doing it are significant, um, but they are part of the business model that um, telecoms operators have. It, it's a, a, they will get a good return on investment because their costs will be much lower and their potential revenues are higher. Um, the need does indeed exist for scarce materials. And I've, I've seen things recently um, where suggesting that uh, Australia may increasingly becoming a source for um, some rare earth metals. Brian saying, you said that 5G doesn't like obstacles such as walls. That sounds problematic. That's not quite what I said. Um, I said that the the millimeter wave frequencies, the very high frequencies, don't work very well like that. Um, the, the, generally, the lower the frequency, the better the penetration you get. Um, so where we were talking about 5G using the 700 megahertz terrestrial TV sim, uh, signal, that will give very good range and very good penetration. The higher the frequency goes, the less good the, the penetration you get. But uh, where 5G is using the same bandwidth that uh, 2, 3, 4G use, it won't have any more difficulty than that. And in the case of um, the low bandwidth um, services for um, IoT sensors and things like that, they will actually have better penetration uh, for reasons that are probably a little bit too complicated for me to explain. <laughs> um, and Milan's saying that uh, many phones are already 5G enabled. When can we expect service in the UK? Cities first, Lake District? Well, certainly it's available in some cities. Uh, it depends which network you're on. Um, I understand that Southampton has 5G services with some networks. Um, just being able to use it on your phone, hopefully I've given you a flavor that kind of, as things are at the moment, it's actually not gonna make an awful lot of difference to the phone you've got now. Um, my own view is that 5G is not really about phones as we know them now in the same way that 
when we moved to from 2G to 4G, um, it wasn't either because the sort of phones that you use on 4G um, with the streaming services, um, like an iPhone, for example, bear no resemblance to the the Nokia 3310 that was great for uh, making voice calls and text, but hopeless for anything visual, coloured and in, in detail on the screen. And I think that 5G devices actually probably won't look that much like anything that we have now either. Um, I think we're probably talking more about things like those 5G spectacles, uh, the, the extended reality spectacles that, that we showed. Um, there's, I think, just have to keep a fairly open mind as to what these, these things will be. And they, these devices are coming onto the market and they will change the way we do all sorts of things. But hopefully I gave the flavor that 5G is not just about what consumers do with their personal pocket device. It opens up a lot of different industrial and commercial applications as well. Bob's saying, do I think 5G will create new social opportunities for people to interact that might replace the life Facebook or will Facebook have even more control through big data intelligence? Um, why do you put that down as, a, as an either or, Bob? <laughs> I just didn't know really whether Facebook might, like a lot of these things, comes, you know, lots of services come and go. We all remember Friends Reunited, which was bloomed into a big thing and then disappeared. Yeah. Um, but if it's all dependent on data intelligence, I know Facebook are renowned for their use of data. And I'm just wondering whether they might start cornering, you know, the whole social environment even more than they do already. I think that's that's a cert certainly a possibility. But if I knew the answer to that question, quite frankly, I would be sitting here talking to you now. <laughs> I, th I think my grandchildren have left it behind for things that children use. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I make a can I make a suggestion, uh, an answer on the power consumption? I think uh, the 5G is going to have so very much smaller cells than uh, the current networks. And the, the antenna will be scattered all over the place on the corners of buildings, along lampposts. And so the range required for transmission and reception is going to be very much shorter. So I think that could be the answer to the well, maybe uh, an much element. lower power consumption. Hmm. There may be an element of that. Um... As I said, I, it's a question I actually don't know the answer to, so I won't try and hypothesize on that. Uh, Vivian's asked, when a vehicle approaches the edge of the 5G range and enters low, low frequency, low data, low speed area, it may be programmed to stop if the driver hasn't taken over, but that isn't necessarily the safe option. There seem to be a lot of potential issues to be addressed before we can fully trust these systems. Hardware is always ahead of the software. Yeah, I, th I think that's fair to say that there are a lot of potential issues that are being addressed on this. And yes, there will be um, some parts of the road system um, that support that kind of thing uh, before others. And they will typically be the ones with the highest volume. But um, in terms of remote areas, yeah, the, the extent of management will be much less, uh, but the need to manage vehicles in cohorts with each other will also be much less. Whereas on busy uh, motorway interconnections, for example, if, if things move in virtual convoys and communicate with each other and, you, and people actually can't do daft things, then things will overall be safer, right? Without question, um, autonomous vehicles will have accidents that driver controlled vehicles don't have, but all the evidence suggests that they will have very many fewer of them, um, which is what will make autonomous vehicles much safer. And believe me, as I get older to the stage where I shouldn't be driving, I'll be quite pleased to have autonomous vehicles that can take over some of that work for me. So. Um, I, th I think one of the ideas they had was to have 
uh, car trains so that cars could save energy by sitting in each other's slipstream. Mm. Yeah, but also by um, controlling the speed much more easily. So cutting out acceleration, deceleration and things like that. So there's, there's all sorts of um, things there. Uh, Robin Speeds asked, to what extent does 5G uh, leverage the wired internet backbone? Um, it's quite variable, really. It depends what and where. Um, to, uh, the, the wired internet uh, provides reasonable speed, say compared to a satellite. If you've got a, a satellite in low Earth orbit at 500, three to 500 kilometers up, that takes quite a long time for a round trip signal. Um, if you've got a satellite in geostationary orbit, that's about 30,000 kilometers up, that's a seriously long way out. Um, but satellites are used for uh, base station backhaul in, in some remote locations. Um, similarly, um, microwave transmission is used uh, between things. You sometimes see these little disks on top of base stations that look like a sort of hat box on its side. Um, those are um, high capacity microwave transmitters that um, channel data point to point between base stations. Uh, Jeffrey Morgan says, on the subject of obsolescence, the public service telephone network runs analog switching dialing for a dial as well as having to deliver uh, high speed data. That's going by 2025 and only VoIP will survive. Um, yeah, it doesn't really run analog switching anymore. That, that's, I don't think that's supported at all. Um, it's, it is all digital and has been for a while. Um, but yeah, it, uh, at the same time, you've got broadband going over the same wire pair and um, yeah, voice over IP will make a lot more sense. Uh, we're, we're all doing it anyway. When we talk on Zoom or we talk on WhatsApp, um, we're talking voice over IP. I mean, do, I, I can't imagine anybody still wanting to make an international uh, mobile phone call, at least sort of outside the uh, situation that we still, I think, enjoy within the EU of not having roaming uh, charge or interna high international call charge. If you're calling, say, somewhere like Africa, um, the, the cost of making a, a mobile to mobile call are pretty unthinkable when you can do it effectively for free using voice over IP. Robin Speed saying the whole technology seems to be being rolled out with barely any scrutiny. Is that a good idea? Um, I have to say that's not true. <laughs> um, there, there, there's, uh, there is considerable scrutiny on, on all of this. Um, there are standards bodies that um, control how it's developed, how it's tested and rolled out and maintained. So there really is a very high degree of scrutiny. We might not see it because we don't operate ourselves in those roles, but um, it, it's definitely there and it's definitely in place. So that seems to have taken us through the questions in the chat. Um, I don't know whether anyone else has anything else that they wanted to bring up or say or ask while we're on the call. I'm, I'm interested in the field of IP Sorry. issue. Hang on, uh, Robin, go first and then Jeffrey will come to you. Sorry, Robin. Yeah, uh, about low Earth um, satellites, satellites that are 300 kilometers up, for example. Um, Musk, for example, is going to put thousands of them up, uh, which is mm. not, a, not very happy for people like me who do astronomy, but uh, that will bring broadband to all the remote areas um, very readily and with plenty of, plenty of speed. The latency uh, point you brought out, um, William, um, it's about a millisecond each way to a low Earth orbit uh, satellite, just the, uh, the distance, a millisecond each way. Uh, may make a difference to some types of service, but not a lot, I would have thought. Mm, okay. Um... I'm, I'm not 
haven't taken a sort of deep study of um, satellite telephony, but um, yeah, it, given the kind of distances involved, um, one would expect there to be more delay. But um, anyhow, uh, Jeffrey, you wanted to make a point, Jeffrey Morgan. No, maybe not. Uh, is he still there? He's still there, but um, I don't know if he realised I'm speaking to him. You can all hear me, so. Um, Jeffrey, did you want to ask something or not? I thought you were... You're muted, Jeff. I think he's trying to say something, but we can't hear. Maybe not. Okay. Um, sorry, William, what I was trying to say there, if I may come in. Oh, yeah. Uh, is that I, I read the other day that voice over internet protocol will enable far greater security so that Granny uh, is less likely to get spoofed by somebody claiming to be some, someone they're not. Uh, your call that you regularly receive from Amazon or uh, perhaps a, with a different accent um, should be identifiable as not coming from them. Um, that would be a nice ideal. I don't know how readily that can be secured because if, if Granny doesn't have the tools for verifying that, um, I think the, the, ser the services will have to be constructed a bit further than they currently are um, to ensure that there isn't that kind of spoofing. But um, certainly it would be desirable because within the existing um, SS7 telephony, it's quite easy to in inject um, a false number, as we all know from a lot of the calls that we've doubtless received. Um, that used to be an excellent reason for not having an, a landline and only using a mobile. Um, certainly for a long time, I, when I did have a landline, the only calls I ever got were nuisance calls. So um, using a sticking to a mobile uh, did eliminate a lot of those. Started to get a few of them coming onto mobile now. Um, but it's it's generally less of an issue, I think. Was there anyone else who wanted to say anything before I? Charlie's is five G going to use ground-based systems, fibre optic networks? Won't involve satellite links with a twenty-two thousand mile round trip. Uh, it'll use all of those things, um, depending on what's available and where it is. Um, uh, there will be considerable redundancy and different overlaps and different technologies that are used for handling the backhaul and the, the internet. She was just 29. Aren't we wired up with the sort of network, fibre optic networks now? Doesn't this sort of make it? The satellite links are necessary. Um, depends where you are. Um, if, if you're in remote areas where there isn't the, the cost justification for putting fibre optic links in, then no, there won't be, which is why, as uh, Robin was saying, um, there are various operators putting huge constellations of um, satellites into low Earth orbit for. Uh, satellite internet. So oh, yeah. yes, yes, there are vast um, fibre optic interconnects between continents and between cities, um, but they don't go to all the places that are needed, which is why you need diverse connectivity in back Thank you. Okay. To find out, we're meeting Dr. Jeffrey Morgan of the Nicholson. Well. Okay, Can I just ask a question? Can give Go on, Bob. Uh, do you think uh, all this 5G oh, will the financial systems? Because I know, like in Africa, a lot of people make payments now through their mobile phone systems. Yeah. Has, has there been 
much thought about how that might change the relationship between people and banking and how they pay each other you know will, will it enable new services to happen in that sort of general area i don't see 5g as being a significant enabler for that i think having um, cellular services in general will do that the the need for very high data speeds or very low bandwidth don't really apply in, in payment things. What you need is security and um, traceability and blockchain has potential to help deliver some of uh, those kind of things, um, but they don't need an awful lot of data. So I, I think to the extent that more people get connected if the costs of operating networks are lower and as technology matures and develops then there is more potential for disintermediation of financial services companies certainly um, and we've seen a lot of in innovation in payment processing particularly for micropayments um, and that will probably con continue but i don't think 5g delivers any any sort of specific benefits that's that's not really already covered by existing networks milan were you trying to ask something you or you convince the art authorities <laughs> how do you see 5g penetrating our lives in the coming months years what's the first thing that we're going to benefit by using it should i buy a 5g phone now or should i wait a year or two um i wouldn't be in a hurry i wouldn't myself um i as i said i i don't think it's in terms of consumers i don't think it's about it's that much about your primary communication device at least not yet i think a, a device that works on 4g will probably still meet most of the, the needs um a lot of these fancier things will become more useful the more people have them and some people will always be early adopters and they'll be keen to, to try these things out. But what would you really do with one gigabit broadband on your, on your mobile phone? Um, as I say, I, I don't see 5G as making necessarily a big impact on people's use of devices in the way they do now. Um, whereas I think, the potential for things like um, augmented reality will start to make a difference for people much more. So it might not be your phone, it might be your next pair of glasses, for example, that will be 5G enabled. Does that, but, include, does that include gaming? Because gaming is one of those things where people like a lot of interactivity. Yes. That could be certainly related to a phone as a base device supporting that so potentially yeah aiming well, in real life so to speak yeah um it, it potentially could but again you know, you've got you still got the, the kind of wetware interface of how you actually use it and if it's still just a touch screen device that's about the size of the palm of your hand um there's a limit to how much more you can interact or how much faster you can interact through that whereas 5g will enable completely new types of devices that as i was saying if you can imagine how different the phones we have now on 4g are from the phones we had on 2g um, the difference for 5g devices will be as much again difficult to say exactly which ones are going to be the winners. There are lots of ideas out there of things that um, that might happen, um, but only time will tell which, which are the which are the actual winners. And some of them might be things that a lot of people hadn't thought of. I still plump for the glasses, I like this. Sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm. Anymore? The message that Emma well, that's going to be the cost to the individual who takes up 5G. Will we have to pay more in monthly rent or 
Will we be charged by data capacity? How's, the, how's it going to all be paid for? Good question. Um, you will need to check your tariffs very carefully. And if you are on a metered tariff um, that's charging you by the gigabyte, then tread very carefully with using 5G. Um, one of my colleagues who works for BT um, got hold of a 5G phone and he went up to Birmingham where they had some of their early capacity um, to do some broadband speed checks. He got through his two gigabyte allowance in eight minutes. So um, yeah, tariffs will have to adapt. I mean, when I was first working with um, 2G packet data, we were charging a pound a megabyte. Yeah, now you, you don't even pay that much for a gigabyte. So prices are, are gonna move um, and it will, I imagine that networks will probably um, adopt the kind of price skimming strategy that uh, based on what market and competition will bear. Um, so yeah, best be wary uh, as an early adopter um but ultimately um services will have to be competitive to be attractive and my guess is that probably in the fullness of time we won't be paying very much more than we than we are now and this is if you buy a phone that does 5g and 4g can you make it work on just say 4g so you don't get unnecessary expenses and when you don't really need the 5G most of the time, I suspect. Okay, you won't be charged. I think it's very unlikely you'd be charged for using 5G rather than 4G. I think you would just be charged for the amount of data that you're using. Um, the difference is that with 5G, you could, you could use that data 10 or 100 times as fast. And yeah, it, if you found anything that actually could consume that much data, you could consume it very quickly indeed. Um, the it is it's I haven't used any five G phones personally. Um, every multiband phone that I have seen has had the option you can configure to restrict certain levels of the technology um, either up or down so I would imagine that those, those options might well exist but I think the industry will be keen to come up with something that's attractive to get people onto 5G because it, it's actually much better for the network operators so that they're, they're keen for people to use this and they won't want to be penalising them for doing so. I'm a big user of streaming services. Is there any, will they all just switch to it or will they have a little choice or how do you see it working out with all the streaming services? Um, you mean streaming services on, on a mobile device? Well, I do it on both the TV and the cinema and the mobile. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, th those will only increase and improve and, you know, you, if you are using a device that has that um, six degree of freedom immersive effect, for example, then you know, you'll be needing vastly more capacity for that. So, yeah, but that that's still that's still a way off. I think you know we could be looking five years out for some of the the more sophisticated um, augmented reality or virtual reality devices before they become mainstream but it will come for sure um, but in the meantime i'm just keep streaming what you're doing it's possible it's it's quite possible that um you'll replace your existing fiber broadband with a 5g router because it may well be significantly faster and more capable so um, 
fixed broadband replacement is is another part of um, how the uh, of the 5G proposition and some of the networks will actually uh, some of the uh, fiber optic networks will actually struggle to upgrade their offering fast fast enough if they've got to get round to every cabinet every premises to put in gigabit services i can see wireless getting there a lot more quickly and um yeah there's considerable scope for 5g to be replacing uh, fixed broadband So the sort of wired broadband is always going to be cheaper than mobile data. It certainly is now, isn't it? Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, uh, there are some, you can get deals around that are quite competitive, even on 4G, that are quite competitive with um, broadband. Maybe not from the major network operators, but if you go for some of the uh, virtual network operators uh, who just lease capacity from the, the main networks. You know, you can be paying twenty pounds a month for forty gigabytes, which is actually cheaper than um, quite a lot of the fixed broadband services offerings. Okay, well that brings us to the end of the formal meeting. Um, thank you all for attending and um, staying with me. We look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks William.